the voice, the Indigenous voice to Parliament and Government. We now have a concrete dis uh, proposal to discuss. As I told you first here on Friday night, the Prime Minister outlined his planned constitutional wording and the referendum question when he made a major speech at the Gama Festival in Arnhem Land on the weekend. Enshrining a voice in the Constitution gives the principles of respect and consultation strength and status. Writing the voice into the Constitution means a willingness to listen won't depend on who is in government or who is Prime Minister. The voice will exist and endure outside of the ups and downs of election cycles and the weakness of short-term politics. It will be an unflinching source of advice and accountability. Yeah, I think he's right on all of that, especially on accountability. People say Indigenous Australians have to be the ones to fix the problems in their own communities, in their own families, in their own lives. That's true. That's true of all of us. But Canberra, since 1967, has had the power to make special laws for Indigenous Australians, but hasn't had to listen to them. Besides, this is how Indigenous Australians have chosen to be recognised in the Constitution, not in some symbolic way or some patronising, box-ticking way, but in a way that can help close the gap. The voice would give Indigenous Australians a say on their issues. And with that will come some clear responsibility in delivering decent outcomes. Fundamentally, this is a reform I believe every Australian can embrace from all walks of life, in every part of the country, from every faith and background and tradition. Because it speaks to values that we all share and honour. Fairness, respect, decency. Enshrining a voice will be a national achievement. It will be above politics. A unifying Australian moment. So let's look at the words that Labor is proposing, the words they want to put into the Constitution, they want you to support to go into the Constitution. First, there'll be a body, they say, called the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Voice. The second part is important. This is a clause that says this body can make representations to Parliament and Government. That's all. No power, no veto, no third chamber. Just offer advice. It's up to governments whether they accept that advice or not. And third, the parliament that has the power. It's the parliament that has the power to make all the laws that form the voice, that decide how it works, refine it and reform it. That's important. There has to be a voice, but any government at any time can change it to make it work effectively. So there you go. There is now some shape to the debate. And the opposition from some quarters is going to be strong. There may well be misinformation and fear campaigns to counter, but perhaps the greatest threat to the cause is indifference. The notion that this is a nice piece of symbolism, but it will have no practical benefit. Yeah, it's important. It should have practical benefits. Otherwise, why bother? We haven't done so well at overcoming Aboriginal disadvantage in this country. We've failed for generations, of course, so we shouldn't be frightened of new approaches. I think most Australians will side in the end with a fair go. If we want to make laws about Indigenous Australians, if Canberra has special powers to help our most disadvantaged citizens, the descendants of the first Australians, then it's only fair. In fact, it's only a fair go to give them a say. But the people who could do more damage to this proposal than the opponents are the activists who demand more and more, ever more. Listen to this ABC journalist, the Indigenous Affairs editor, no less. What sort of transfer of power does this mean for Indigenous people? Because that needs to happen. Um, and, and so I just think he's going to have different messages to sell to people. But I actually think there's a lot of appetite now to see some transformative change. When we imagine what a voice would look like, I think it does need to have teeth. It does need to be feared and revered. It needs to be a building. It needs to be an institution that has much more than a voice. It has um, some control. Um, and some autonomy. We need to imagine that this body has, has much more than just an advisory role. A transfer of power? 
a body to be feared that is much more than a voice, that has some control and that needs to be much more than just an advisory role? Talk like that, activism like that from the ABC's Indigenous Affairs editor, well, that can only kill off mainstream support. Extremism is the biggest threat to The Voice. Take Greens Senator Lydia Thorpe, who used the Black Power salute as she turned up in the Senate to be sworn in for this term of Parliament. And then this is how she took the oath. I, Sovereign Lydia Thorpe, do solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that I be faithful and I bear true allegiance to the colonising Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Senator Thorpe. I'm going to wait quiet. Senator Thorpe, you are required to recite the oath as printed on cards. And so after that kerfuffle, the senator had another go and still managed to make her contempt for Australia and its institutions pretty clear. Senator Thorpe, order. I, Lydia Thorpe, do solemnly and sincerely affirm and declare that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II, her heirs and successors according to law. What a sideshow, hey? Senator Thorpe already has a voice in Parliament, thanks to the Greens. We shouldn't let her theatrics put people off a proper voice. In fact, she argues it's not enough anyway. She would want more. In the mainstream world, the debate is much more sensible. And the biggest issue for The Voice now is the actual detail about how The Voice will be formed, how Labor would shape it under legislation, how many people chosen in what way and meeting how often, etc., etc. The Minister for Indigenous Australians says that detail will come soon. There will be a lot of information out to the community about what people are voting on. It would be nuts for that not to happen. Yeah, we're going to need to see that detail, even though we know that Parliament will always be able to shape the voice as it sees fit. Now, just a quick plug too, I'll be back to debate the voice with Andrew Bolt after seven o'clock. He and I don't agree on a lot when it comes to the voice, but we both agree that you should debate about these things and disagree civilly.